So this more or less is the presentation that I did at uh, CAPEX right after our annual general meeting. So as you all know, Ukraine's been in the news a lot in the last six months um, with the uh, ongoing war with uh, the Russian Federation. It's actually a continuation of a war that's pretty well started from 2014 after they invaded uh, the two eastern provinces of Ukraine and Crimea. And now it's, um, it's escalated to the point where they're bombing our cities. And uh, today it was, uh, was a bad day in Ukraine because they were firing kamikaze uh, drones into the cities uh, for hours on end. So this is a current map of Ukraine. Um, everybody's seen this probably on the news and um, uh, media many times over. <clears throat> our neighbors are Russia in the east, Belarus on the north side, Poland on the, on the west here. And we have uh, the, 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 the Car Carpathian or Transcarpathian area. You have Slovakia, you have Hungary joining, and then you have Romania on the south side here. So um, these areas are all significant because philatelically speaking, there's been a lot of different issues that came out over the, over the years. And historically, there's been a lot of border uh, movement back and forth between the various uh, the Ukraine and the neighboring countries. And um, going back to uh, the early 1900s, this is a map of Ukraine from around 1918, the Ukrainian National Republic. And you could see the borders extended um, further west and um, north into what today is Russia, because a lot of these were ethnic lands where the majority, uh, over 50% plus of the population was Ukrainian or Ukrainian speaking. It does not show the Western Western Ukraine here, which was on at the time this map was issued, was still part of the Austro-Hungarian or Habsburg Empire. Um, so that doesn't appear on, on this map. And this is a map that was presented by the delegation to the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. Uh, with the proposed borders uh, of Ukraine based again on the, um, the um, ethnic population of um, the different areas. And as you can see, interesting enough, the Kuban area here, which is part of the Russian Federation, was had a very large Ukrainian population. And even today, Ukraine is spoken in this area um, uh, predominantly, um, even though there's a lot of Russian of course, uh, because it's part of the Russian Federation. And a lot of these areas here on the north, uh, like Belgorod, where the Russians are, are, are firing their missiles from, that was all ethnic Ukrainian areas. And then the northern parts in Belarus was included. And I guess uh, some of the uh, more or less, this is probably correct with where Brown or Poland was. Um, anyways, um, so at the Paris Peace Conference, the delegation didn't receive much acknowledgement because the U.S. was more interested in having a stable Russia and um, re, uh, rebuilding Poland um, from uh, all the years of the, the partitions, etc. So um, Ukraine sort of got um, put in the backseat uh, at that conference. Right from the beginning of the 20th century, there's been a lot of political unrest, chaos, so to speak. Um, in Ukraine, um, starting with the uh, dissolution of the Russian Empire once uh, Tsar Nicholas stepped down, 1917, I believe. And um, until that point, you, the, the eastern part of Ukraine um, was under Russia for about 350 years um, after a treaty was signed, um, uh, supposedly for the Russian empire to help Ukraine with some um, wars that were happening with Poland. And then the uh, Western part of Ukraine was under the Austrian-Hungarian empire. So you can see a lot of these over the time, how, how these are the provinces across the top of Ukraine and this is the timeline. You could see the, the various uh, political or, or the groups that uh, were vying for control of, of, of different geographic areas of Ukraine. 
and some of them were, were more significant than others. Um, the Ukrainian National Republic was uh, recognized uh, internationally uh, when they declared uh, independence in 1918 and um, had uh, diplomatic ties with many other countries. But there were a lot of smaller groups that were coming in and out and grabbing and trying to grab control. And um, as I said, there, there was total constant, constant chaos and, and churn and, and wars were going on nonstop on, on all borders. So philatelically speaking, where, is, uh, where do we start with Ukraine? Well, we can start with the stamps that were issued by the Russian Empire in the 1900s called Zemstvos, and the Russian Empire wasn't able to, to produce stamps for all the area because the Russian Empire was massive. It stretched all the way from you know, um, the, the eastern part of Europe all the way into Asia, all the way to the Pacific. So they gave authority to the various districts to issue their own stamps locally. And um, for, um, a, lot of, a lot of Ukrainian collectors focus on the Zemsto stamps that were issued by various regions, uh, districts in, uh, in Ukraine. And there's, there's a lot of them. There's, as you can see, there's 790 stamps. And you can get these, they show up on auction. Um, they're fairly pricey, but they're quite, uh, quite colorful, and quite interesting to, 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 to see. A symbol that you'll see on, on all Ukrainian stamps and currency in the last hundred years, um, was initially um, it was initially adopted in uh, 1918 from the state symbol of the medieval state Kievan Rus, which had its capital in Kiev, and in um, primarily in 19, nine, uh, late 900s, 980, uh, one of the grand princes Volodymyr the Great issued coins, and that's where the trident first appeared on those coins. Um, so there's many different designs of, of these uh, coins. And um, one of the famous graphic artists in Ukraine adopted the trident from these coins and introduced them into um, uh, as, a, as a symbol for, for Ukraine. So these are the first stamps that were that appeared in January um, after January 22nd. That's when the uh, fourth universal, the, de it's the fourth declaration uh, was issued stating that uh, Ukraine is now a in sovereign independent uh, country, even though we had a lot of other groups within Ukraine vying for control and there's you know, constant battles going on. But the first, um, the first stamps were not really postage stamps, they were currency stamps and they were printed on cardboard. They look like stamps. Um, but they were card, they were used instead of coins because metal was very uh, um, precious at the time and required for military purposes and things like that. So they were printed on cardboard and on the back it stated that these um, these stamps were used in lieu of, of coin. So that's what they were used for. A few months later, they were reprinted now on paper on dumped paper and they were issued as the first set of definitives. And um, so these are the, the, uh, the, the graphic artists. The first two were by Anton Sadada. Uh, the Shah is worth around one cent. So there's a hundred Shahs and one Hedeving, which is the, the current uh, domination, denomination. And uh, the last three was by Rehori Narbut. And um, Rehori Narbut designed many of the stamps in Ukraine, uh, many of the uh, banknotes, uh, a lot of the, uh, the alphabet designs and legal documents use a very, very prof uh, profound uh, uh, graphic artist. Uh, the second definitive stamp came out when the Riving, this one came out after the tariff rate started rising and uh, for, the tra for money uh, transfers. Uh, so they needed something of a higher value. Again, that's a Narbu design. And um, eventually they were thinking of reusing these definitives to replace the provisional stamps, which I'll show you in a, in a minute here. And these are the, the, the classic Trident overprint stamps. So the, the problem, as you saw with the timeline, uh, Ukraine was 
independent for three years until until uh, Russia um, basically won won the wars, and um, you know there were Polish Ukrainian wars, Polish Russian wars, Ukrainian Russian I mean Ukrainian Russian wars. Everybody was fighting on the borders. Um, so uh, for a country, a new country to start printing their own stamps was problematic because you didn't have the you didn't have the proper equipment. And uh, I didn't have the timeline. I looked. Canada Post takes two years to come up with a with a stamp. So these guys had months to come up with something. And so what they did, they had large stocks of um, um, tsarist uh, um, stamps available that were still, um, pre you know, they still had stock. And they basically authorized all the local uh, cities or districts uh, to start overprinting them with tridents, and there was no set design of tridents. So a lot of these uh, cities or districts came up with their own designs and they, they used different methods of or media to create these tridents. Um, they had rubber stamps, uh, lithograph, and as we see later on, they even went to other things. So this is key, you've had three types. Collecting tridents is an interesting area. There's over 2,500 of them. And um, a lot of probably, uh, large portion of our society do collect trident overprints uh, but it's a it's an interesting area because you sort of have to become eventually an expert in what is a real trident and what's a forgery so i can tell you that on ebay probably 90 percent of everything is forged um, and it's not unless you know what you're looking at or you have a base collection uh, a very reference collection that you can compare your trident overprints to, you're gonna end up buying fake material and spending a lot of money in some cases. Um, Odessa, the 10, 10 different types. So a lot at our, at our we have an, an annual meet uh, in, in, in Pennsylvania, we all get together. And a lot of times uh, somebody brings in a collection of tridents that they just got somewhere and, and they're saying, are, are these legit or not? And then we get into a lot of discussion on whether, whether a particular trident is overprint is legitimate or not. So, you know, you start looking at different characteristics of it, you know, the, the, the type of ink, you know, um, uh, did it, does it fluoresce on the other side? Is it an oily ink or not? Or, or, or you know, what the shape is. And so, you know, it's, it's quite uh, healthy discussions over that. Um, Odessa had 10 types. These are metal, hand stamps. So you know that when you look at these tridents, the shape of them were fairly consistent, um, easy to identify, but um, there are tiny variations to them, which they're still relatively the same shape. Um, and I was mentioning earlier that the KF2 type here, these rubber hand stamps, when they, when they made um, the hand stamp, the various rubber hand stamps, they, they all look slightly different. And basically they took five of them and they would wire them together and then use that to overprint the, the on the sheet five by five. I think the, the, the sheet was, they would basically overprint, um, you know, apply five tridents at a time. And then you, you would look across the strip of five, you could see there's slight differences in, in the tridents, but the metal ones are fairly consistent. Um, and um, here's a this overprints on the ruble stamps, Kharkiv, um, which has been in the news, uh, with, uh, with which is very close to the Russian border. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, I don't know, it's under like 50, 40 kilometers or something. Um, they uh, again, these are all hand um, uh, metal hand stamps. So again, the the the, the trident is consistent across um, all the stamps that you would see. Uh, again, rubber hand stamps. Um, these ones here, Podilia, are the toughest because they are the smallest trident overprints and um, they, uh, the ink smudges a lot. So uh, you really have to look at them at high mag magnification to tell the difference. And surprisingly enough, there are a lot of forgeries of these two. I don't know why anybody bothered, but um, they are forged. Podila. Now, these ones are the most, really the most interesting and the hardest to classify or type um, of all the Trident overprints. There's 57 of them. Now, these, these ones here, a lot of them, well, the vast majority were made from wood. 
there's only a few that were metal. Um, that's majority of wood. Basically, they would take a block of wood and carve it. So you can imagine that you would cry, you would carve a trident and you start applying it on each stamp and somebody's there doing that all day. Well, after some time of uh, wear and tear, the shape of the trident starts changing and it starts deviating from what the initial the shape of that trident uh, was. And so now you have a lot of discussion within our, our, our society, whether you see two different tridents, are they actually the same trident? And, and one is just the worn wooden hand stamp um, or not, or is it a forgery? So um, in the last, last uh, few years, one of, our, one of our society's members has, has written some fantastic articles on these uh, trident overprints, and he's done um, a lot of uh, analysis um, um, on them. Um, he managed to uh, obtain a, a significantly large collection so a lot of a lot of material to 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 peruse, look through, um, and uh, has, like I said, has written some amazing articles. Every year we have a Kotick Award, uh, which is basically awarded to the best article in our journal, and he's scored it pretty well, won consistently every year. And the winner of the Kotick Award, the article is then published on the uh, Articles of Distinction on the APS site. So you can always go there and find the article that he has written about the Tridents. Uh, it's well worth the read. Okay, so as I said earlier, there are a lot of forgeries. Tar tridents are, were forged um, extensively um, over the years um, for some reason. Sorry, Jerry, but a lot of them are coming out of Poland. I don't know why, but <laughs> when I go on eBay, they're all, they all say they're coming out of Poland. So somebody there is having a, a, a good time making these forgeries. The best way to, to, um, uh, to tell whether what a real Trident overprint looks like is by the, uh, the, the money transfer cards. And these were issued at the post office. So, you know, these are legit. Um, and uh, you could use these as if you, um, if you do can purchase these because these transfer cards are not in, in, inexpensive, but um, they, they are a good reference material to tell you what the overprints looked like um, that you can compare against. Um, some people collect uh, revenue stamps. Um, these were applied on legal documents and such, what such not. Um, some are really interesting. Um, I know Mark Stomakovich, he's got an interesting collection that, of uh, documents that he's, um, he's exhibited, but they don't, they don't have the revenue stamps. They actually have the Podilia, uh, a, a variant of the Podilia overprinted uh, stamps. But um, these ones, uh, again, these are all Narbu designs. Um, you can always tell his designs just by looking at the artwork. Um, and then they had the uh, theater stamps as well. So a lot of, some people collect these as well. They're quite nice. Now back to the history. We, uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, uh, we had uh, significant battles have occurring with, uh, with uh, Russia that was uh, trying to uh, take over Ukraine at the time that Ukrainian National Republic was being uh, formed in Kyiv, in the capital, and they were coming in from the east uh, into, into, towards Kharkiv. Um, uh, at the same time, um, uh, the, uh, the government in Kyiv uh, was forced out of the capital, and they, start, they had to start moving east, uh, westward towards Poland, and they went through a, a variety number of cities before they ended up in Poland. Uh, so uh, by August 26, 1919, the government in exile was in Tarno and they started, they were still issuing stamps um, in expectation that in, in the following years that they will eventually be able to return to Ukraine and uh, the war would turn in their, in their favor. So uh, uh, a few things happened uh, that, that, that would hopefully would have helped them. But um, these ones here are, are, are courier field post stamps. And they were just the, the regular definitive stamps and they were overprinted uh, in Ukrainian um, uh, courier post. Another huge definitive set of stamps were printed in Vienna. This is a 14 set stamp um, uh, of stamps. They were designed by Mikola Ivasyuk. Um, actually at Capex, we honored 
him with a uh, uh, picture poster stamp, uh, the one Hiraving on a Canadian picture poster stamp and an illustrated cover. Um, he designed a lot of these stamps in, and they were printed in Vienna. Um, the sad story is that at some point he lived out, he lived in Europe. He was invited back into Ukraine, um, into Kyiv to, to uh, the lecture at one of the, or work at one of the art, art schools there. And then a short time after he was arrested uh, overnight and they, uh, in two, within two days, they basically charged them with treason and he was executed. So, um, that was a life of many of the in, uh, Ukrainians that were trying to make a difference at that time. Um, but the, the story around these stamps, they were never issued. And um, what happened around this time was that um, um, uh, there were a lot of, uh, as I said, border skirmishes. So there was an ongoing war with Poland um, over, over the, the Western or Ukrainian Western border. Um, but at, at some point that the, um, the war ended and a treaty uh, was signed with Poland, the Treaty of Warsaw, where Poland uh, now became an ally of, of Ukraine and uh, with Pilsudski, uh, who was the, the, the commander for Poland, and Petluda, who was the head of the uh, Ukrainian directorate, uh, the government in Ukraine. And they basically, um, uh, Poland said to Ukraine that they would help them um, fight the Russians and out of uh, and have them pushed out of Kyiv um, to allow the government to return. So they were successful in in doing that. But shortly after, the, the Russians came uh, came back again into Kyiv, and Poland then um, after some some time because they were also fighting Russians, uh, having a Russian war. They signed a, a treaty with Russia uh, basically to, to end the skirmishes that they had. And that basically ended Ukraine's hope for any, for any uh, independence. Um, so that was around the late, end of the late uh, 1920s. So these, these uh, Vienna issues here, were never issued. Um, you find them, they're a very inexpensive set. They're really beautiful. And they come perfed and imperfed. Imperfed are fairly rare. And the one thing you need to watch out for here are this one here on the very end. So a lot of times when you look um, and you see them in eBay, they're, they're, they're not expensive at all. But people that sell them will say, oh, that's, that's a proof. And really, that is not a proof at all. That's printer's waste. And there's a lot of printer's waste where they were using the same sheet and reprinting on the same sheet this way or that way. Um, and they were not, these are not proof stamps at all. Um, but you also find these stamps printed on maps because the paper was, uh, there was a shortage of paper. So if you flip uh, you. stamps on the back, you'll actually see maps on, maps on the back as well. So there are those stamps that were, that were printed in uh, Vienna. Um, these are the um, Ukrainian field post again. They took the Vienna issued and they just overprinted them Ukrainian field post, but they were again never issued because uh, after 1920, um, the, um, the, the whole war basically with Russia ended and that was it, the end of uh, Ukraine's uh, aspirations. All right, so going back to the west side of Ukraine now. So that, that part was under Austria-Hungary for um, uh, 300 plus years as well. And after uh, uh, World War I, um, again, um, all the countries on the west side of Ukraine, uh, Poland, uh, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, there were a lot of border skirmishes. Everybody was trying to improve um, their border lines. <laughs> um, so um, the Western part of Ukraine, interesting, um, the, pop, the, uh, the, the overall population in Western Ukraine, the majority were Ukrainians. However, the, the, main, the main cities were, were primarily 
Polish, um, Polish and Jewish, uh, and some Ukrainians. So uh, uh, November the first, um, the um, the uh, Western Ukrainian National Republic um, was proclaimed because there's a there was a coup and uh, the Ukrainian forces went and overnight they they advanced, they were supposed to go in three days later but uh, for whatever reasons um, they moved in on the first of November and they took over the city and that basically started the that was the beginning of the Polish Ukrainian war which lasted I think six months. Um, so there was ongoing fighting uh, for control of the city uh, of Lviv. And uh, during that time, the, the Western Ukrainian Republic issued over 100 stamps. Um, and these were all pretty well printed or, or, or overprinted uh, uh, Austrian stamps, which again were re readily available and in stock. The first, the first issue of the overprints are these um, overprints with the, uh, <coughs> the lion, which is the um, traditional uh, symbol for, for uh, Lviv, um, because it was founded by King Lev. Um, I think it was the medieval times. I don't remember what year it was, 1200, 1300s or something like that, or a son, anyways. Um, so these, these are fairly uh, rare, but they're also forged. And the trick here is you need to know how to discern which one is a forgery and which is not. And that's fairly easy. Um, I've seen catalogs where they actually show these overprints. And of course, whoever, whoever puts the, the overprint into the catalog ends up getting the marker and filling in the, the gaps that identify the real overprint. <laughs> so um, out of these three, what you look for is a break here. There are two breaks in the left frame. One, two, one, two. This one has no break. So this is the fake. Looks like the other ones, but it's fake. The other thing you look for is the break between the tail and the main and the body. There's a break here. There's a break here and there's a break there. This one joins. So this is a fake. This is a forgery. So avoid these at all costs. So going, going uh, after uh, November the 1st, uh, the government starts, the Western Ukraine government, they started overprinting, as I said, um, Austrian stamps. Uh, this is the uh, the Kolomea issue, which is a city um, in, in Western Ukraine. And the registration mail stamps, there are two, 30, and 50 in strips of five, 10 sotik. Um, again, Western Ukraine, heavily forged, um, unfortunately, and um, and not cheap to buy. These these are fairly expensive. One of our members in our society is actually, he's been working on this project now for probably five years plus, but he's working on a uh, two volume uh, book of um, postal history of Western Ukraine. And he was fortunate in that he uh, uh, was able to obtain the reference collection that our Western Ukraine uh, expertizer um, had unfortunately uh, Jerry Tkachuk passed away this year, and so now we, we've lost an expertizer in our society for Western Ukraine. But um, we're looking forward to this publication that's going to be coming out. Um, it's going to be quite, uh, quite good. Um, so, there, like as I said, there are, many, there are many stamps over printed, Austrian stamps. This is the first Stanislav, another, another main city in Ukraine, Ivano Frankius today. Uh, beginning of March, 17 stamps overprinted. And they kept overprinting because they didn't have anything. They didn't have any stamps that they printed themselves, same as the in the central and central Ukraine and Kyiv. Um, this is the second Sunnyslav issue. There were four sets. Um, Bosnia, Herzegovina, field post stamps and the Kaiser stamps and as where he's young, he's old. Um, third Sunny Slav issue. Uh, this one's interesting. Um, collectors call these the bird stack because <laughs> they look like the trident looks like a bird. Um, and these are these are fairly fairly easy to obtain. The set here. Um, the the Cronin stamps are were printed on uh, granite paper, so you can see the fiber, darker fibers here. 
these are these are the common ones. To find the one without that is very rare. It's hard to find. I still haven't found my set yet, but they're they're out there. Again, another. This is the fourth Stanislav issue over prints, and by July 1919, after Poland took over most most of uh, Western Ukraine again, uh, these stamps that were that were printed were never issued. And, um, some of these are quite rare, and they command them, uh, you know, quite a bit of money for the sets. But they uh, um, they depict um, um, in this example here are the Archangel Michael, who is the patron saint of the capital Kiev, and here you see the lion for Western Ukraine for the view. As I mentioned before, the, the, there are skirmishes on, on, on the south side uh, with Romania as well. So they, they overprinted their own, their own stamp, Austrian stamps. Um, not all collectors or philatelists, Ukrainian philatelists collect these. They don't consider Ukrainian, but they were, they were issued on, on, on uh, prior Ukrainian territories. So uh, they're still quite collectible, in my opinion. Um, uh, you have to watch some of these were... Um, officially overprinted and others ones were overprinted for philatelic purposes. So that's, that's an interesting thing that um, I didn't mention about Western Ukraine. With Western Ukraine, a lot of those stamps um, had involvement from dealers. Dealers would fly into Western Ukraine to get their hands on these, uh, these uh, Western Ukraine overprinted stamps that for speculative purposes uh, there were there were stories of uh, military personnel going to the printer and saying, "Here's a stack of sheets. I want you to overprint all of these for me," and then he would take off with them. Right? So um, they're not they're not they were not really sanctioned by the government. And um, there's a lot of uh, covers out there that are that are dealer covers. You'll recognize them immediately. Um, uh, once you get familiar with um, with a lot of the Western Ukraine material, uh, Soviet Ukraine. So after after the Brest-Litovsk uh, Treaty, where um, all the all the prior treaties were null and void, and um, uh, new 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 borders are being drawn, uh, the Bolshevik government basically took over Ukraine and they issued a few sets, um, not many uh, during the early 20s. Um, this one's kind of kind of interesting in the fact that it's from 1923 and it's a semi-postal for the famine in Ukraine. So Ukraine had three different famines, uh, 21, 32 and 46. Um, if law, law, there's a lot of research going into these famines, especially the famine from 32 to 33, where any, well, seven, most people say 7 million died. Some historians are saying maybe just over four. Stalin, when he was asked, held up 10 fingers saying there were 10 that died. So I, 10 million, um, that's still ongoing because the material is, is hard to get. Um, the, the Soviets didn't want this to be known. Even today, to this day, they, they deny that there was a intent to um, kill off all the, um, the uh, independent farmers um, in Ukraine. And basically it was all agricultural um, based. Um, uh, all uh, the first two famines for sure were while people were starving in Ukraine, tons of wheat was being sold to other countries uh, by the Soviets and um, uh, no one in Ukraine was allowed to have any food at all. Um, I'm sure that happened in, in the last few months where the Russians were taking boats, uh, ships filled with Ukrainian wheat destined for other countries, uh, Africa and um, and what and, uh, similar countries um, and taking that to Russia. And um, so it's a, it's it, the story, the story hasn't changed in the last hundred years with what's happening over there. 
so this issue comes in uh, both um, perfed, I think imperfed and um, uh, and also watermarked. Uh, those are those are rare as well. World War II, Germany, Nazi Germany occupied all of Eastern Europe all the way to uh, Stalingrad pretty well. Um, they formed a general government in Poland and Western Ukraine. And they also uh, created the Reichskommissariat in the rest of the Eastern part of Ukraine in September 41. And uh, they brought their um, standard Hitler heads, we call them definitives and overprinted them in Ukraine. There's other, other ones that were overprinted OST, Ost, East, that was used um, in um, the Baltics. Um, the general government had their own stamps. They gave permission for a short, short time for local issues. So a lot, there's a number of uh, different regions or districts in Ukraine that had their own stamps. And these are talking about Uber dollars. We're talking like in the thousands to get these. And these ones you only buy if they're expertized. Um, a lot of times, honest dealers will say these are reproductions this, because a collector wants to have a facsimile of the real thing. But um, if you have them on cover and, and uh, you'll be paying substantial dollars for them on auction. Um, I know the, the, the Hitler head with Ukraine overprint, there's one error that I've seen with the missing, missing E. I've never seen it myself, but I've seen images of it. The, the, the Hitler head by itself is, is a really nondescript, boring set. Um, once you have it, you have it. But uh, in our society, we have one individual who actually has a very nice collection of uh, covers uh, with uh, these stamps. Uh, and he's been collecting uh, examples from every, every district or every postmark in Ukraine. And he has quite a, quite a collection and he's exhibited uh, this collection as well. So um, that makes this more, more interesting to, to collect um, from that perspective. Carpathia, Ukraine, um, again, so we're now in the, again, in the southwest corner there. And um, so with Czechoslovakia, they held that area for till again, the war. Um, and then the Ukrainians there, rose and uh, they formed a, a government which only lasted a day but there was an attempt to do that so they they took the uh, the uh, Czechoslovak stamp with the uh, Car Carpathian Ukraine that's the traditional Ukrainian wooden churches that you find in the Carpathian regions they issued the stamp yeah I think this also appears on another Czechoslovak stamp without the Carpathian Ukraine on it so that was the only stamp that, that was issued then. Now, there were other regional, um, and here it is on the, on the first day cover, opening of the parliament on um, the 15th of March, 39. There are many other um, overprinted stamps for the Carpathian Ukraine region. <coughs> um, all, until recent, uh, none of them appeared in Scott and one of our members in our society, um, through a lot of work with uh, Scott, was able to get them to publish um, a set of these uh, a set of these uh, overprinted um, Carpathos Ukrainian stamps that are now basically included in the in the catalog. So that's a phenomenal change um, for for Ukrainian collectors to have these issues now recognized but there are many more that uh, that are out there that are not that are not uh, in the catalogs um one of our members passed away years ago he had he had a phenomenal exhibit uh, a gold win a gold medal winning exhibit on on all these issues um i think it was like 10 frames and in fact i think his um i think members of his family took his exhibit and published it in a book available on amazon and you could see the see, you could see the exhibit in its entirety. So these um, again, there was a lot of back and forth with the different political groups 
uh, countries here, uh, Slovakia, the socialist uh, Hungarian over, over uh, socialist can the Ukrainian National Committee over printing Hungarian stamps. So every 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 political power that comes in wants to leave their mark. Say, yeah, I've been here, and here are my stamps, and um, only to be have them to be replaced by the next uh, group that comes in. These are the Soviet stamps. Um, I don't know, they use the sewing machines here or something to perforate them, but they're a fairly, fairly uh, primitive, in my opinion. And in uh, November 45, the end of the war, Czechoslovakia gave up Carpathia, Ukraine to the Soviet Union. So that was, that is why it is now part of, part of Ukraine. All right, after the war, well, during the war, there were a lot of Ukrainians that were uh, f the younger teenagers were forcibly taken by by Germany um, from Ukraine to work in German factories, um, the Osterbeiters. And um, after the war, a lot of them uh, ended up in displaced persons camps. Uh, Regensburg was the largest in Germany. Um, it was uh, not a good idea to go back to Ukraine. If you, if you lived in, in Western Ukraine, that was under, under Poland at that time, it was Polish, then the Russians wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, take you back. They would have to leave you. But if you were born in the Eastern part of Ukraine, then there was an agreement initially by the Americans that the Russians were allowed to, to repatriate you. Um, and that was not a good thing because they, many of those people that were taken back were ended up either getting killed or in uh, Siberia, sent off to Siberia. But uh, eventually, eventually, the Americans stopped that uh, practice. So the, uh, in, ter in, in, uh, the, in the DP camps, there were many of them. Um, they issued their own postage stamps for internal mail, mail within the camps. If, if mail was sent out of the camp, then they would have to add an additional uh, German um, definitive or something for postage out into, into Germany or, or to, um, you know, inter for international mail. So these are all in, um, within the camp. Beirut is another DP camp from 45, had 3,200 Ukrainians. They did their own, their own designs. Um, all the philatelists, there were a lot of philatelists in those days, and uh, more, more DP camps. Okay, so uh, fast forward from the Second War to the fall of the Soviet Union. So between, between that time, between the, 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 the Second War, actually going back to the 30s till the fall of the Soviet Union, there was really no, uh, no concept of national or, or ethnic identity within the Soviet Union. Everything was, uh, according to the Russians, was basically, um, it was a melting pot into this concept of a Soviet, homo sovieticus, uh, which was the, the common Soviet man who spoke the common language and had the same common culture. Um, the good thing for Ukrainians was that prior, between the 20s when the Soviets first formed the government in, in the Soviet Ukraine till the, till the 30s, there was some cultural rebirth there, allowance for, for Ukrainian um, cultural um, events um, and things like that. Um, so there's a, there's a, there are a few postage stamps that were overprinted in Ukrainian language. Actually, that is a, an interesting uh, area uh, that we're one of our members is exploring because traditionally Ukrainians bristle at the fact of anything Soviet uh, because of the history. Uh, so they just know nobody wants to touch anything from that area era. But uh, one of our members has uh, is uncovering a lot of interesting material from the twenties. Um, that uh, is in Ukrainian, so that that may be legitimately okay um, for for as a collectible area, and um, it's been large, like I said, largely unexplored and doesn't seem to be any catalogs. But anything anything from the 30s to the to the 91, it was all 
there was really no concept of a, a Ukrainian identity or any other other than the Russian. Um, so after the fall of Soviet Union in 91, um, Ukraine was basically left with a postal system. So just like in the, in the 1919 time period, uh, what, what does the government do? They start overprinting what they have in stock, which are the Soviet stamps. So these, um, um, some of these uh, uh, overprinted stamps uh, or the actual plates for these overprinted stamps were done on, print, on, on um, printing machines that were smuggled into Ukraine from Canada. And um, one of our uh, local uh, our liberal MPs, a pri former, local, uh, former liberal MP, was involved with that, and he actually um, told us the story how he how, how they smuggled the print the printing machines into into Ukraine, and they had decoys and all that stuff, so they wouldn't get caught um, because there's still a lot of uh, even though Ukraine in, declared independence, and to this day there are still a lot of people that are are, are uh, aligned with uh, with uh, with the Soviet Union, and they miss those days. So they smuggled, those, smuggled uh, the printers in and they, they used the plates. Uh, actually, Mark saw one of the plates uh, to print these cave uh, issues. Um, but a lot of the other local cities um, uh, created their own overprints as well, uh, or, or utilitarian stamps, as Mark would call them. They're primitive stamps with just... Uh, uh, Printed on the, I don't know, these were kind of machines, I guess that or something, I don't know, back then. Um, and um, they, uh, anytime you have stamps where the, um, they're produced by local um, printers, you know there's going to be abuse. So this is another area fraught with forgeries as Mark can tell you, and eBay is probably 90% of all their 91, 92, 93 issues from that time period are all forged. They're not forged, they're fakes. Um, so here's an example at the bottom. There's a key, there's a key of uh, stamp. There's a Boyarka. Uh, what's that one, Mark? Number three, Nikolayev. And the fourth one, uh, I don't know. That, that is, that is, fifth uh, one is Mikolaev, the 500 carbers. Mikolaev. Yeah, Mikolaev, yeah. yeah. So the fourth one is fake, not a real one. And you see lots of those. And you see lots of other stamps, uh, le uh, legitimate Soviet stamps overprinted with all kinds of interesting names and images. When we started collecting these stamps <clears throat> 20 years ago, there were coming out of Ukraine in, in buckets. And uh, everybody was excited in our, in our clubs that, wow, we have something new that we can start collecting. And we were buying all this stuff in, in droves. And now, nowadays, we, uh, we finally look at our, our collections of fakes. <laughs> um, yeah. But there's some, uh, the, the books, there are a number of books that have been published on the provisionals. Um, the first one we came out. Um, uh, the first ones that came out in Ukrainian language, printed by Ukrainian philatelists, and uh, they were ex excellent publications. Our society actually translated one of them into English, so that it is available uh, for anyone who's interested in collecting provisionals. It has all the legitimate issues only. Unfortunately, the last update on that uh, catalog came out in Russia because the, back in the day, the, the, um, the, the thinking was that most collectors are Russians or Russian speaking. So um, we're limiting ourselves by publishing in Ukrainian. Let's do everything in Russian. Um, so that's to my disadvantage because I can't read Russian. You sort of have to guess at what the words mean. But um, uh, hopefully that will change in the, in the coming years because now with the war, uh, anybody who spoke Russian in Ukraine is now speaking Ukrainian, even 
even the ethnic Russians that, that grew up in Ukraine and now have children, they're teaching their kids Ukrainian and eventually they'll learn Ukrainian as well. Uh, no one wants to learn the language of the aggressor. Okay, modern, after the provisional period, we have the, uh, the modern Ukraine. And uh, so now Ukraine is printing legitimate stamps um, they, at the beginning, they didn't have their own facilities. They were still um, designing and building those. So the first stamps were printed in, um, with the assistance of other countries, Canada, Russia, some in Russia, some in Austria or Hungary. And uh, these were like world quality standard. Um, these are the first two stamps, the 500 years of Ukrainian Kazakhdom. Um, and the 100th anniversary of Ukrainian in Canada. So Canada, a uh, Canadian banknote company printed a lot of stamps, well, not six here, uh, for Ukraine. All these were printed in Canada, and they also did the first, uh, the first set of banknotes as well for Ukraine. Ukraine has uh, experienced a huge inflation period in the early 90s. Um, so Ukraine decided to switch from uh, not all their stamps, but the, the, the regular uh, definitive stamps from having values to, to letter stamps. So that way they can easily change uh, what, uh, how much these stamps um, are, are worth. Um, even the currency, um, they originally came out with Karbovansi and those grew from like one Karbovanits to five or half a million covered bovinets and then they change currencies they revalued everything into hryvni um so that was true even for the stamps they were originally in karbovansi and then they were revalued into hryvni so some of the at the at the end of the uh provisional period um many of the stamps were paid to us dollars so because the rates were changing so so rapidly they basically would look at what the exchange rate was for for that week and they would say okay this is how much it's going to cost you to mail. Um, there was a total total chaos there at the beginning until until the the things started the economically started to settle down. Anybody who was interested in topical stamps, Ukraine has it in buckets. There's since since uh, the initial release, the first release of Ukrainian stamps, there've been around seventeen hundred stamps issued to date, and they cover all all kinds of topics, anything, um, any area that you want to collect topically. Um, there are catalog, or, or sorry, there are uh, albums available. You can buy them commercially for modern stamps, or we have a number of people within our society that have published their own albums. Some are, are, are you have to pay for, um, uh, and one individual has, a, has an album that is available uh, for free and he, he updates it regularly to for all the new issues, and you can just download the, the album pages. You can buy albums that are already that have the hinges already in place, so you just don't have to do much other than just get acquire the stamps and put them in. Um, the hit the hit the one on the bottom right is the I covered my the Ukraine the histories. There's a lot of history stamps, but this is the recent one with the famous one where the soldiers giving the 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 um, flagship. Moskva, the Black Sea, the finger, and then two days later, Ukrainians shot two torpedo, two two cruise missiles, and sunk the darn thing. I really like this stamp. This was voted best stamp for two thousand and one, and basically, she's on our UPNS banner uh, that we bring to all our shows. Um, a lot of the a lot of the artwork is uh, is as many is in many other countries. It's quite beautiful. Some Ukrainian firsts, um, first international airmail service, Vienna to Krakow to Lemberg or Lviv today and, and Kiev. So here's the flu post stamp. And uh, there's a lot, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these available, uh, very collectible. Um, we've had, I've seen exhibits for the first, uh, international airmail um, for different uh, rates in different cities. 
Uh, it's quite a fascinating area to get into. Uh, the, for, the world's first zip code was invented in Ukraine. And here's a postcard that uh, is promoting the use of the zip code. Uh, index, I-N-D-E-K-C, index. And the postal code is right here, 14Y8. Postal cards are quite interesting too. Um, they're printed in Moscow and um, there's a whole set of them um, printed and interesting enough, some of them were printed uh, during the uh, Ukrainian famine in 1933 and they were promoting the amazing harvests in Ukraine and all the ag agricultural products that um, were being harvested and um, promoting all that uh, while everybody was starving. And uh, well, the independent farmers didn't want to join the, the collectives, so to speak. Uh, okay. Uh, Ukrainian stamps, uh, Ukrainian topics on foreign stamps. There's a catalog of these uh, one of our members published and they're Thousands of these. Um, you can. Every country has some some aspect of the Ukrainian culture uh, topic on it. Uh, what's interesting is a lot of the uh, in individuals you may come across Soviet stamps uh, that were they made significant contributions to different uh, fields. Um, in fact, were Ukrainian, but uh, they were never promoted as Ukrainian. Even hockey players. <laughs> Um, but now Ukraine is reclaiming its heritage and um, putting, putting these individuals on postage, postage stamps to make people aware who, um, how Ukrainians have contributed. So more, more examples here. This is, uh, this is for the Chernobyl tragedy, Belarus. Igor Sikorsky, um, inventor of the helicopter, was Ukrainian. Uh, Shuchenko, a famous Ukrainian bard, poet, uh, born in serfdom, and uh, basically um, uh, wrote a lot of um, uh, poetry about um, breaking the bonds with your, uh, with your, uh, from slavery. And this is a Vatican stamp showing the uh, uh, Virgin Mary and the Saint Sophia. Uh, cathedral in Kiev that's uh, over a thousand years old. And then there's a whole other area collecting that uh, is getting uh, more visibility and that is Ukrainian Cinderella's and fantasy. So they're not postal stamps, postage stamps. Uh, some people do did put them on uh, on covers well with the, with the legitimate stamps, but um, they, they, these have been produced um, since uh, the, the late 40s to the 70s on various topics. Um, and there are lots of them. Nobody really cared about any of this material at the beginning. They were worth practically pennies. Now, all of a sudden, a lot of people in Ukraine are buying these and um, as, much as, they, as much as they can find. And, and the prices on these are growing. It's... Um, it's phenomenal. There's so much interest now in, in, in Ukrainian philately. So these are more, more examples of the Cinderella's and that were made during the provisional period. <clears throat> so there's a Poltava overprint. Somebody's, somebody's adventure in their basement and decided to create one of these. Sumy, another city in Ukrainian, in Ukraine. Uh, again, somebody made this up on the top. Um, I'm not sure this is comm commemorating the, the famine in 33. Um, again, it's, it's, these are not legitimate. Polisia, which is the northern part of Ukraine. Uh, at, uh, Polisia is right on the border with Belarus. That's what this guy here is on ours. Uh, Ukrainian scouting um, organization called PLAS. These guys were just prolific in producing stamps. And um, one of the um, members of Gatapa has a, an amazing collection of uh, Ukrainian scouting stamps, uh, better than some of our members uh, themselves. Have. So um, it's quite something to see. These are all niche collecting areas uh, uh, based on you know, your interest that uh, you like to follow through on. Um, 
finding the material again is a challenge and it's probably a lifetime of searching to find everything but um, it's out there and that's it that's our website www.pns.org